Fifthly, it promotes participation. Participation in content production, knowledge production, news production. Almost anybody can be a broadcaster. Almost anybody can be a publisher. And it fundamentally changes power structures in the process. Voices, opinions, views from all over the world are accommodated in ways not seen before. And finally, it enables us to collaborate at a scale at almost near zero cost in a way simply not possible before, a web browser being the only uh, requirement. Now, I want to pause over the last three of these reasons and give you some examples of what we are seeing on the web. First of all, the business of sharing, and indeed the question of having to get to more people. The rise of the open re educational resource movement, to me, is one of the most exciting and indeed one of the most crucial developments of our time. There's an increasing amount of excellent educational resources going online, some of which is provided commercially, but most of which is provided free at the point of use. And I hardly need to tell an audience like this how significant that is for the many people who do not have access to decent libraries, textbooks, and educational media. The statistics of visitors to these sites are astonishing. Millions and millions of people from virtually every country in the world. One does need to understand, however, that at the moment it is mostly universities in the Northern Hemisphere which are making material available. And while the material related to science might not be dominated by a particular worldview, and I think even that could be contested, that relating to humanities and social sciences is seriously deficient of material which, be, which would be recognizable and embraced by people whose cultures and traditions are different. And that is before we even begin to think about the language issues. Those are non-trivial matters, especially in the educational endeavor. If would-be and unconfident learners recognize nothing of what they know in educational materials, it's much more difficult for them to pro progress. And we have a leadership challenge here for universities all over the world. It seems to me if universities do not recognize the importance of changing the present dominance, then it's hard to imagine who would. So it's both a responsibility as well as an opportunity. I'd like to put the last three reasons, openness, sharing and participation and collaboration, into a kind of framework, a framework suggested first by Clay Shirky in his book, Here Comes Everybody, and a framework which has also been embraced by Kevin Kelly in his description of the new socialism, um, described very nicely in this month's edition of, of the Wired magazine. Shirky describes the hierarchy as a useful one for sorting through what he sees as the social arrangements rendered possible by this new media. Groups of people start off by simply sharing photographs on Flickr, information on Facebook, video clips on YouTube, etc. Then they progress to cooperation, then to collaboration, and finally what he calls collectivism. Cooperation is when individuals work together to a large-scale goal. For instance, not just put their photographs up on Flickr, but tag them, bookmark them, etc. And in the process, enable aggregation and analysis of astonishing power. Collaboration produces results beyond the achievements of an ad hoc arrangement. Examples here are the open source software projects where peer producers participate in what is described as a gift culture, donating extraordinary amounts of time and effort and the product is free. They don't get paid in monetary terms, but they gain reputation, enjoyment, experience, etc. They are building a new kind of economy, and we're all the richer for it. And finally, there's collectivism. In a collective, and I quote, there's a vast army of contributors managed by a much smaller group of coordinators, like Wikipedia compared to the Encyclopedia Britannica. The basic point I'm making is that digital work, networking provides an infrastructure that makes this kind of working possible, a kind of working that would have been impossible in the past. It means that we can harness many minds from many places and many cultures and disciplines to focus on the complex and difficult problems of today's world. And I think it's very interesting to place these developments into the context of a huge increase see that we're seeing worldwide in volunteerism. People realizing that not all, can be, all problems can be left to the government. 
and that community efforts might well be the solution to many of the issues that face us. What Kevin Kelly is arguing is that the power of sharing, cooperation, collaboration, openness, free pricing, transparency, are proving to be much more practical than we thought possible. The power of what Kelly calls the new socialism is bigger than we imagined. And what I'd like to suggest to you here today, that these so-called new social arrangements have enormous power to change higher education as we know it, and to change it for the better. And of course, higher education <coughs> is changing already. Here are some quotes from the 2009 Horizon Report, which seeks to identify and describe uh, the use of emerging technologies in higher education. Firstly, with the growing availability of tools to connect learners and scholars all over the world, online collaborative spaces, social networking tools, mobiles, voices over IP and more, teaching and scholarship are transcending traditional borders more and more all the time. So education's got global. Secondly, the notions of collective intelligence and mass amateurization are redefining scholarship as we grapple with issues of top-down control and grassroots scholarship. Today's learner says the report want to be active participants in the learning process, not mere listeners. They have a need to control their environments and they are used to easy access to the staggering amount of content and knowledge available at their fingertips. So learning, if it ever was, is no longer a passive process. <clears throat> Thirdly, experience with an affinity for games as learning tools is an increasingly universal characteristic among those entering higher education and the workforce. The success of game-based learning strategies owes active participation and interaction to the center of the experience and signals that current educational methods are not engaging students enough. So methods of teaching need to evolve. And finally, the report says mobile phones with their vast capabilities are turning into indispensable educational tools. Never mind e-learning, M-learning, mobile learning is increasingly where we need to concentrate. So delivery is different. Education coming to us, not just uh, to libraries. Now, what are the consequences of these emerging technological changes for institutions? And what are the opportunities that the Horizon report uh, suggests? Let me just give you five examples. I'm sure there are many more. First of all, we have to ask ourselves serious questions <coughs> about what it is that we're trying to teach our students. Don Tapscott, in his last book called Grown Up Digital, makes the obvious point that this digital age requires new abilities. And he suggests some shifts in the way we approach instructional design. And I'm going to pick out just four. From instruction to, to discovery. It's not what you know as much as how you can navigate and discover what, what you do with what you discover that counts. Secondly, from individual to collaborative learning. Apart from what we are learning about new social networks of this digital age, we already have sound research that tells us that collaborative learning is more effective in increasing academic performance than individual learning. More than that, we learn more about each other in the process, more about people in other parts of the world, more about other cultures, other worldviews. Thirdly, from broadcast to interactive learning. We already knew that the one-size-fits-all kind of model was not ideal, but it was the best we could do with the resources we had. We're no longer limited in that way, and we can stretch ourselves to different learning models and encourage different kinds of intelligences. And so fourthly, from a teacher-centric to a student-centric model, where teachers become more like guides on the side and rather less than sage on the stage. So... <clears throat> The one big thing about uh, what it is that we're teaching has to be examined. Secondly, we have to ask ourselves some serious questions about our, the cost of our present model. At the moment, for the most part, we have an expensive business model where each university devises its own version of relatively straightforward material. One has to ask exactly how different can undergraduate chemistry or physics be, not picking on anybody in particular, of course. <clears throat> 